Before we begin today's episode, I want to give a quick but important heads up. In this conversation, we'll be discussing sensitive topics, including alcoholism, abuse, suicide, gun violence, and human trafficking. These subjects can be distressing, so please listen with care. If these topics are triggering for you, please feel free to pause or skip this episode. Remember to prioritize your well-being, and if you need support, don't hesitate to reach out to someone you trust or a professional. There will be numbers for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, National Domestic Violence Hotline, and National Human Trafficking Hotline in this episode's description. And I could barely do a 25-year bear crawl. But what changed it is that I was a dead last in that class. And next thing you know, I looked up on my last round of bear crawl. I was on my knees. I couldn't barely finish it. I still have one full 25-year old back. Everyone, at least I would say 20 to 30 people in that box, everyone was cheering for me. Welcome to Wild Development Studio. Join us as we venture into the breathtaking realm of wildlife arts and untamed adventures. With captivating stories from the field and ideas to dive into the visual arts, we'll ignite your passion for conservation. Get ready to develop something wild. Welcome to Wild Developments. I'm your guide, Lauren. Today, we're diving into a powerful conversation about resilience, growth, and the strength it takes to rebuild after trauma. Our guest today is Rish, founder of Dads and Deadlifts, a podcast and foundation that focuses on supporting boys, young men, and dads who are survivors of childhood trauma. For Rish, fitness became a life-saving anchor during some of his darkest times. When he began his healing journey through CrossFitness, he faced challenges head on, just like deadlifts, an exercise he once avoided out of fear. He learned to ask for help and embrace the difficult work, and that became a turning point, not only in his fitness journey, but in his life. We'll be talking about how dads and deadlifts came to be, the role of fitness and mental health, and how Rish is helping men rise above the pain to lead healthier, more purposeful lives. Rish, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely, 100%. Thank you for having me. So you founded Dads and Deadlifts. Before we dive into that, can you tell us a little bit about your background before you started this mission? Yes. Um, so, oh boy. Uh, so I think going, going back, uh, why and when did I start this mission? Um, I, I think it started off with uh, my son being born in 2017 December and right after that um without any understanding next thing you know um I had been uh pretty much like mildly depressed and that turned into alcoholism uh of course uh, at that point uh my marriage with my son's mom was also not going well and when I reached out to my guy friends, all I heard is man up. And that finally hit me at 37 because that word I heard several times growing up in India. And especially at 23 when I lost my dad in 2004 in November. Uh, barely one hour after they declared my uh, death of my father, family members started coming in and I was only barely 23 years old. Um, didn't understand what's going on. Uh, I mean, I should not say I didn't understand what's going on. It's more like finally realizing, like, who do I go to? And uh, everyone, the word, that word came up, uh, man up. This is what men do. Uh, don't cry. Support your mom, support your sister. And um, I just listened and I went with it. Uh, we'll get to that story a little bit in detail, but answering your question coming back to 37 years uh, at 37 year, uh, years when I had my son that's where everything kind of came to fruition like I'm like okay so I have heard this statement before now my friends are saying it so where did this originate from why, why what do you mean man up and I know you or anyone else right like if, if they listen to a 43 year old man right now I'm 43 and asking that question, 
seems very odd, right? Like, what do you mean? You don't know what man up means. I know what man up means. <laughs> but my quest, it went into, why is that? Who started it? Why man up? Why not woman up? Right? I mean, I, I, I had legit questions. As stupid, as innocent as it may sound from a 37-year-old man. And that's where it took me to the journey of where it all originated and how we as men and women have, you know, lived in caves all the prehistoric days and how men used to be hunters, women used to be gatherers, and the idea of not showing weakness. But then my question went deeper and deeper, but now we don't live in caves. Now we don't go hunting. Now in one word, we are saying Me Too movement and uh, like promoting feminism and women's rights, which I'm all about. Then why are we saying man up still? And I, I couldn't understand the disconnect and I started questioning and that took me to psychologists, um, historians. I basically, I interviewed a lot of people during COVID. I had a lot of time right after the divorce. And I realized, like, this is an epidemic. And next thing you know, while my son was maybe about six months old, I was, I was drinking every evening. And I remember first time he called me Dada. And I was drunk. That changed my life. Next morning when I woke up, hung over, got ready, went to work. On my way to work, I realized something. Like I just missed the only moment that every father or every parent lives for. Dada or mama. And I was drunk. That propelled me to completely change the lifestyle that I wanted, that I had, and went into a true deeper meaning of what life is. And that's how it all started, dads and deadlifts. Because when I was going through alcoholism, and when that thing happened, I came home and I'm like, I need to put an end to it and try to understand what's going on. But by that time, sadly, uh, my son's mother uh, already left to her parents' place with my son. So, of course, now as as a parent, you were confused. Uh, mm -hmm. And not only that, let me talk about dad. As fathers, we are very confused because one, we didn't have a, we don't, we don't, no one tells us our, our role for first six months or a year because that baby barely needs us. And to be very frank, like, you know, it, it hurt me. I'm like, what is my role in all this, right? I'm putting him to bed at night. I'm picking him up. But really, I mean, so there was all of that mixed emotions that came in. And then finally, when there were no one at home, I decided, like, I'm like, why am I doing this? I, I should not be. I'm not a good father. And I started going to counseling around that time, too. And through all of that, I realized that I was sexually abused as a kid, which I subconsciously or unconsciously never really talked about. The reason I didn't talk about is in India, we grew up in a joint family. If I would have told my dad, my dad would have gone to jail because my dad would have literally taken a very, very, very bad step to hurt those people who did this. And when I say abuse, I don't mean one time. For two years, consistent abuse. And I wrote that in my book. But doing that therapy, doing the hypnosis therapy, doing EMDR therapy modalities, uh, it's basically was shown to me that your body keeps the score 
and there's a book on that. And uh, this is your body's way of letting you know that you have a son now. That changed my life. My very first reaction was to do hell with it, end it. You don't need to pass this on to your kid. So I planned my suicide for a full month of August of 2018. I planned it. I did everything. I wrote 18 letters to my kid, one for each year, what he needs to do, all that. A letter from a father to a son. Um, I spent enough time with my dogs. Um, and then in September of 2018, the day I decided to end it, um, I went to my local gym where I used to work out at to get my last workout. Um, as the universe would have it, uh, that day the chip didn't work. And you have to remember, like, it's very difficult to make people understand when someone is in that zone. Sometimes even I talk about that person, it's me. Even I cannot relate to him anymore, six years down the line. But I have a lot of compassion for that guy, right? Um, when I was locked in, like 9 to 9.30 tonight, I need to end it. But I need a workout before I leave. So I looked up walk-in gyms. The first thing that came up, new species CrossFit. I never did CrossFit in my life. I'm like, you know what? Who cares? Just to work out, man. Let's get it done. Let's get some sweat in. Let's get some. So I walked in and while I was doing it, I was crying in the car, literally crying and telling myself the universe, I don't know what this is about, but I'm ready. And uh, I wish uh, I would have found a community who are like me, who is like me ride or die. Like I'm a person, you know, you know your weakness and you know your strength as a human being when you grow up. I know my strength that if I connected with you and you call me and it can be in Antarctica and you said, Rich, I need you. Trust me, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. I'm that guy. Um, I walked into that CrossFit gym. In the wall, it's written, tribe or die. Wow. I still get emotional. Um, I did my workout. I was a big guy then, and I could barely do a 25-year bear crawl. But what changed it is that I was a dead last in that class. And next thing you know, I looked up on my last round of bear crawl. I was on my knees. I couldn't barely finish it. I still have one full 25-year go back. Everyone, at least I would say 20 to 30 people in that box, everyone was cheering for me. They stopped, they were clapping for me. And that just shook me. Uh, I still haven't found to name that emotion of mine. It's not ecstasy. It's not happiness. It's not joy. It's, I still don't know how to explain it. There's a piece of relief with a piece of anger, with a piece of joy, with a piece of sadness. All of it that came back at the time. Like, so there are people who believe like me, who believe the way I do. And next thing you know, I didn't go home. I sat there at that box till 9 p.m. or till 8.30 p.m., I think, till they closed. Came home pet my dogs, and I realized that day, like, nah, there's more to it. There's more to it. And uh, this is why I always talk about dads and deadlifts, is because the name came from deadlifts. is one of the workout that you basically lift a lot of weight from the ground and straight, straighten up and down. It's a compound movement, but it's not a very easy thing to do. And that used to be something I never liked it. I always used to injure myself. And I decided that I will take help and learn how to do it right. So when I got there and when I started deciding about the name of my podcast, I said, like, what better than dads and deadlifts? Because deadlifts taught me how to be humble, how to embrace humility, and how to actually really ask for help. Not out of my ego, but genuine help. Like, hey, I really 
want to overcome this. And that's where the name signifies that ask for help. There are things that you may not know. There are things you may go, go through, but always ask for help. Trust me, if not the next person, 10th person will help you. But there are people who will help you. Well, and you need a community if you're going to get help. And you found your community that day. I mean, people don't realize how much just cheering somebody on that small act literally saved your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gives me chills to think about. And so, gosh, I don't even know where to go. There was <laughs> so much to take in. And that's an amazing story. And uh, so moving it, when people go to your page, dads and deadlifts, what kind of resources can they expect to find? What kind of help can they expect to find? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the things that uh, I need to do better, I'm not very good at marketing. Same. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but um, I have the resources means that when I started, I started off with uh, lots of um, basically clubhouse events, virtual events. Uh, that will hold space, especially during pandemic, uh, that rooms every evening to host men and talk about mental health. Uh, so we did a lot of that. And then we also did two world virtual world summit on human trafficking. Um, because it is a pandemic, it's pretty much related to everything. Everything is interconnected somehow, right? Um, most of the human traffickers are men. And if you go uh, to the bottom uh, of the barrel, uh, you will see that no one's born evil. Um, no one comes to this world thinking that they will do some heinous crime. It's our culture, our society, uh, unfortunate situations of people and uh, everything else re regarding, you, you just fill in the blanks on the society and our, our way of embracing things. But when you see these people, when you hear these stories of not only the victims, but the perpetrators and themselves, I always question that, what was his childhood? How many times had he been told man up? Interesting fact, I ask this question, everyone. If you go look up all the school shootings, not a single one is female. Why aren't, we why aren't we focusing on that? You can do gun control laws, you can do all that kind of stuff, but how about we go beyond that? Every single shooter in the history of United States our men, our boys. Mm. So what are we really dealing with here? It's not that no one knows about it. Everyone knows about it. We just decide to not do anything about it. Now people are talking about, but still, it's not, not nearly as enough that we should be talking about. So what I decided is, it's, I kind of pivoted a little bit while doing all this research, is that, I want to start also interviewing women who went through domestic violence, who went through abuse, because that's the only way you can understand what they went through and how their other partners reacted or acted for that matter. And that's the only way we will come up with solutions. It's, it's far far from anything, but at least I know that we all are talking about nowadays. And that discussion starts needs to happen. Every time I hosted or I had been through different events where we're talking about women's seminar, mental health, empowerment versus a men's mental health seminar or webinar or an event, I mean, I can tell you if 100 women show up to an event, you're talking about two or three men show up to that event, if it's just men. So 
the disconnect is right there. And this is what I wrote in my book. Um, also, Me Too movement is incomplete without men. Because if you cannot teach the other sect of the gender segment how to express, how to communicate, and how to be vulnerable. And when I say vulnerable, I'm not talking about the dictionary word of vulnerable, like be open to weakness. But when I say vulnerable, vulnerable when you need to be. And that's where I think the magic lies, that when both men and women come together, and we all know that, men over all these years, through whatever conditioning they had, have decided that, okay, we will hold this whole patriarch and egotistic value of ourselves. And now our next generation, us even, are suffering from it. So if us, our generation do not do anything, our next generation, my sons, will suffer. We'll go through the same thing. The cycle is not gonna get broken. I gotta agree with what you said earlier that nobody is born evil. It is something that is definitely learned and through experiences and people can either turn that into something evil or like you had every right to do something horrible and you have taken what has happened to you and you've turned it into something that's going to help other people you, through your lived experience. You're, you know, how, where the disconnect is and you know how to try and help other people and get that conversation going. And you're absolutely right. There is not enough talk for men, like, especially when women have a baby and they talk about postpartum depression yeah there's some hormonal stuff that goes on there but you know nobody teaches the dads what to do and what they're supposed to they've got a huge role now too and they don't talk about that uh in your book breaking up with yourself the cover image has a broken coffee cup and emerging from the center is a tree with heart-shaped foliage and the leaves are blowing away what does that image symbolize to you it's um, so the idea came from um, I didn't want to put a um, alcohol glass uh, to not trigger. Um, that's where the idea came from. That uh, for me, um, my purpose came from that pain of breaking that habit. And um, the green symbolizes life. So. In your research, did you, how do I want to say this? As far as like the man up and where that even came from. I mean, I, when I picture caveman days and, you know, the hunters and gatherers and men going out to hunt if they're trailing game and it gets away and they can't feel their feed their family, I certainly imagine somebody being super emotional about that, being out in the heat and spending all that energy. And that's got to be emotionally totally. I don't understand where we've over the years decided men can't cry in public. I think like this question I asked so many times and so many people uh, over the last I mean, four years, no one knows the answer. It's funny thing, no one knows the answer and everyone has different stories. And, but overall, I think how I feel it, like I think at some point, some kid was disappointed, upset, were crying and they were given the examples of men, you know, and talk about, Athletics, talk about any hard masculine work and connect that, that dot to our ancestors in cave, cavemen days, basically. And all I could think of is 
what if what happened to those days if say if a kid somehow were playing with rocks and actually smashed his finger did someone tell him man up um and then i come back to now i'm like every time i see a soccer field or any other place dude it's okay man up come on get up it's all good yes there is there is a reason for that and there is a space for that um i do agree with one of the most uh, controversial figure jordan peterson uh, i i completely agree with it actually not somehow i 100% agree with it and that's where i think my next book is i'm writing my next book dead man walking um curse of the previous generation and the blessing that comes with it that 100% men the way jordan peterson says is i don't know exact quote but some somewhere like um men should be monsters only then they should know they would know the power of that and that's the only way they would know how to tackle it so i believe in it it's the same thing that in tao tao principle they said like it's better to be a a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war right um but the fact is at what point we teach our men or boys for that matter next generation and how because for example the group of youth is around coaches and teachers so if those coaches or teachers are not taught and not educated it's automatically getting passed down which is unfortunately that's what's happening because no one is talking about it but then you go and check with every place coaches have taken a different approach teachers have taken a different approach jailers in jail right correctional facilities with men i'm talking about complete their signs their proof their evidence that it changed so men are human beings yes we can change mm -hmm. but that requires everyone to be on that requires every man to be on board and i talk about this also in that imagine back in the day how in our ads right marlboro men right coming out of the cowboy hat with got a horse and lit up a can you Imagine that guy walking into a counselor's office. Can you even imagine that? No. No, they Because wouldn't go. <laughs> that's, that's the image of the man we have created in us. Mm -hmm. Like that's our hero. But what if what if we change the narrative and we create educational material and content in this in this age of social media that men are crying. It's okay to be expressing it's okay to be vulnerable it's okay to be strong and at the same time be weak when it needs to be for people who needs you i was just going to say i wonder how much marketing does have a role in in all of that because in the very very early days of marketing the color for boys was pink and the color for girls was blue and then it switched yep. and you know who is the person pulling the strings and deciding this i, I think it's the consumers uh, and this yeah. is it's so funny you brought this up not a lot of people know that not a lot of people know that and i talk about this in my podcast in like one of those early podcast days that marketing have so much of a role to play people do not even realize and it's not about marketing i don't want to say it's marketing in a very i don't know um on harm way like i feel like it was very deliberate very intentional the way the diamond you know the diamond became popular like oh yeah a diamond is girl's best friend i forgot the name of the company i think de beers uh, yeah they, they popularized it that's all mm -hmm. uh, i forgot if you go back on youtube i mean it's there i forgot the exact situation but something happened and they just like it became like a big deal and since then it just blew up same thing boys were blue girls were i mean boys were pink girls were blue i think it's mostly the consumerism and the feedback they got they switched it 
And then that stayed. But my thing always is like, it's not about the colors I'm worried about. It's about the baskets you are creating with those colors I'm worried about. When we come in, when we are all born, Lauren, if, you, if we just close our eyes and just listen to everyone else and we talk about humanity, we are all in one bucket. Scientists is looking at us right now. We are a blip in the map, not even. Mm -hmm. And here we are creating buckets. Pink basket, blue basket, this, that. Like, why? Because that now, stuff sells and fear sells. I heard on Joe Rogan that you hear on the news, if you ask anybody, they would say crime is on the rise. Crime has been on the downfall for years and years. Like this is the safest it's ever been. And it's just, hey, marketing needs to be more responsible in, in what they're doing to our mental health. But I'm so glad there are people like you that are out there trying to change that narrative. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's it will take a while. I'll be say I'll be honest with you. I think um, I'm just uh, very I'm not even there. Uh, I do local stuff, but uh, I, I will say that uh, we all need to come together uh, to do this because this is something that it will not change. It will not change if we if we all don't come together. Well, I do have to bring up nature a little bit on my nature podcast. <laughs> I no, do want to ask I love you. Your, I love your pictures, by the way. Thank, oh. oh, I mean, you're doing amazing. I, I, I was like watching you. I'm like, oh my God. That's... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Um, where is your favorite spot in nature? The mountains. The mountains. And I've never been to India. Does India have beautiful mountains? India has a lot of beautiful mountains. As a matter of fact, where I'm from, Calcutta. Uh, we are from West Bengal state and Eastern India. So eight hours train ride or two and a half hour flight, you can see Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world. Wow. In Darjeeling. Darjeeling is called uh, basically, you know, this is amazing. It's called, I forgot what it's called. It used to have a surname basically, um, Northeast India. Uh, and then Everest is in literally like, five hours flight not even five like four hours flight ride, flight from us uh it's in nepal uh but uh, growing up everything kind of seemed like oh it's there but uh my love for mountain came from uh running um and hiking and now i'm obsessed i'm like um anytime i any chance i get i want to go um capture a peak and it's more, it's less of a, that mountain itself. I think it's the mountain inside of me. I think it just kind of pushes me nowadays. Well, that, that's going to be the quote for the show right there. <laughs> the mountain. <laughs> wow. That should be the title of your third book. <laughs> third book, yeah. Mountain inside of me. Do you have a favorite mountain in the United States that you like to visit? Um, I plan to summit Denali. Wow. Um, I had given myself about three years. I'm already planning to, I'm already like training, started getting into more mountaineering side, this, that, but Denali and Rainier are my two targets for sure. Uh, by the time I turn 45 in two years or 46, maybe, but, uh, all the 14,000, uh, all the peaks in Colorado, all the 14,000 it's like 14,000 feet. So very good. And where can people find uh, your website and all your social media and keep up with what you're doing? Yeah. So I, uh, you can find me at uh, rish underscore d dot a dot d on Instagram. Uh, also on my website, dads and deadlifts foundation dot org. And uh, I also have an Instagram of dads and deadlifts. And of course, uh, my business. Urge Juice, um, that's a juice company, but we are rebranding ourselves on our 10th year as a wellness brand and uh, basically encouraging people to remember that gut health is mental health, what you're putting in your body and embracing all the life habits the right way, right? Like meditation, sauna, uh, ice bath, uh, red light therapy, nature walk. So 
I am so glad that you're getting your own podcast because I could sit here and talk to you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> You've got so many great endeavors that you're doing. So before we go, what is one tip that you have for someone that would like to connect with nature? Oof. Um, the very first thing I would say, when you go to the nature or when you are in the nature, stop thinking. Stop thinking about even being mindful. Stop thinking about doing anything. Put one foot in front of the other. Watch your feet. Watch that dirt in front of your feet. I literally do that. I, I mean, like my first, uh, you'll be, I'm running 50 miles this Saturday for a race. And every, my first mile is always like starts with a gratitude. I don't take off. Oh, I gotta run. My first 50 mile, my first mile of any race or any time in the nature is an ode to the nature and my gratitude to the nature. And once you're that, I would say, keep your foot one in front of the other. And the biggest thing I would say, look up and watch the green. Trust me, you would feel you are embraced, you are hugged and you will never go back. Like it, it is an exhilarating feeling. Like you don't need to worry about this, I have to be this, I have to do that. No, just when you're there, man, just be there. That's it. And just look up. Done. Perfect. Thank you so much. And until next time, get outside and see what develops. Thanks for joining Wild Development Studio. We hope this exploration into the world of wildlife arts and adventure has sparked a desire to get outside and connect with something wild. If you have an adventure that's awe-inspiring, don't hesitate to share. Click the link in the description to submit your story to have it featured on our show or be a guest. Until next time, keep connecting to the wild and see what develops. The views, opinions, and statements expressed by individuals during Wild Development Studio productions do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Wild Development Studio or its affiliates. Participation in any activities, expeditions, or adventures discussed or promoted during our content may involve inherent risks. It is strongly advised that individuals conduct thorough research, seek professional guidance, and take all necessary precautions before engaging in any such activities. Wild Development Studio, its representatives, or employees shall not be held responsible for any injury, loss, damage, accident, or unforeseen incident that may occur as a result of participating in activities inspired by or discussed in our content. By choosing to engage with our content or act upon any information provided, individuals do so at their own risk and discretion.